Okay. Hi everyone, uh, uh, hope you enjoyed the lunch. Uh, so in the second part of uh, uh, the presentation, we're gonna discuss a uh, different entity. We'll talk about uh, adenocystic carcinoma and how to differentiate it from polymorphous adenocarcinoma. We uh, will uh, discuss the diagnosis of mucoepidermoid carcinoma. We uh, also, uh, talk about SNX cell carcinoma and secretory carcinoma, and we will finish with a brief update on the current uh, fifth edition of the WHO. Adenocystic carcinoma is a biphasic tumor that composed of ductal and myoepithelial cells. It represents around 25% of all salivary uh, uh, gland uh, malignancies, uh, most commonly uh, occur in the parotid gland, but around 30% occurs in the minor uh, salivary gland. It's important to understand the biology of adenocystic carcinoma, although the tumor is uh, slow, but is steady and can like progress slowly, but it is uh, like uh, persistent. And uh, while the five-year survival of a uh, tumor is uh, good, the long 15-year survival is poor. And even when the tumor looks cytologically bland, this tumor is infiltrative and has high uh, recurrence, uh, a high rate of perineural invasion. And these features uh, put adenocystic carcinoma in the high-risk uh, category in, uh, in terms of treatment. Often this uh, tumor is treated with radiation. Interestingly, lymph node involvement is not a common feature of adenocystic carcinoma. Therefore, uh, typically lymph node dissection is not performed for this tumor. Here we see the biphasic uh, differentiation adenocystic carcinoma with the ductal cells surrounding lumen with uh, isonophilic cytoplasm, central nuclei, myoepithelial cells at the periphery with hyperchromatic nuclei and uh, angulated uh, features. Perineural invasion is very common in adenocystic carcinoma, and the tumor has propensity to infiltrate along uh, the nerve tract beyond the main tumor mass, perhaps accounting for the high recurrent rate of adenocystic carcinoma. There are three main uh, growth patterns of adenocystic carcinoma, uh, cribriform, tubular, and solid growth pattern, and often we see more than uh, one growth pattern within the same tumor. Solid growth pattern is characterized by lobule and sheets of uh, uh, solid growth without the obvious biphasic ductal and myoepithelial uh, differentiation. Moreover, the uh, cells in um, solid growth pattern appears larger and more atypical compared to the cells in tubular and cribriform uh, patterns. Mitosis and focal areas of necrosis are common in solid growth pattern. It's important to recognize and report solid growth pattern in adenocystic uh, carcinoma as uh, study have shown that it's in part uh, poor prognosis. And there is a grading system of adenocystic carcinoma that was proposed based on the amount of solid growth pattern calling adenocystic carcinoma grade one when there's no solid <laughs> growth pattern, uh, grade two when uh, there's 30% uh, or less uh, solid and high grade or grade three when there are more than 30% solid growth pattern. At Memorial, we don't really use this grading system we don't call adenocystic carcinoma usually grade one or two, but we do report 
the presence and the amount of solid growth pattern. I think we believe like adenocystic carcinoma act as a group like to intermediate to high grade rather than uh, low grade. Uh, However, our data along with other study has shown that any solid cross pattern matters and not only cases with 30% uh, or more. High grade transformation, it's a, a phenomena that not unique for adenocystic carcinoma has been reported in other salivary gland types. Uh, like high, the high grade uh, tumor is characterized by carcinoma that is pleomorphic and ugly and shows high mitotic activity, uh, high mitotic uh, figures and activity, uh, and is difficult to recognize as a specific or entity without having the conventional, typical uh, lower grade uh, adenocystic carcinoma. There is uh, overlapping and uh, morphologic overlapping between solid adenocystic carcinoma and adenocystic carcinoma with high grade uh, uh, trans uh, transformation. And you could consider the uh, aggressive feature we discussed in solid adenocystic, like mitotic activities, necrosis, are emphasized and exaggerated uh, uh, in high grade transformation. In 2009, uh, Sital et al. Uh, reported 11 cases of adenocystic carcinoma with high-grade transformation, and they reported this feature to uh, be helpful to differentiate between adenocystic carcinoma with high-grade transformation and solid adenocystic carcinoma. Basically, in high-grade transformation, you see confluent sheets of solid growth, and the cells appear to be uh, more atypical and more pleomorphic, and they show more ductal feature in high-grade feature compared to solid adenocystic carcinoma. More importantly, in high-grade transformation, we see high mitotic activity, at least 10% high power field with uh, like uh, uh, necrosis, often comedotype necrosis. Ki-67 is more than 50%. Uh, more than 50 here we see side by side adenocystic carcinoma with high grade transformation and solid adenocystic carcinoma. Notice that the cells here in high grade transformation are larger, more pleomorphic, and they have prominent nucleoli. They show more ductal features, and uh, we see here the comedonecrosis. Also notice that this case has a cribriform pattern and not solid. So, like. Uh, Adenocystic carcinoma high grade transformation is not always solid and can have a cribriform pattern. And this is important because I've seen this called uh, salivary duct carcinoma before. And uh, the basaloid morphology, the absence of the AR positivity, the myoepithelial uh, differentiation can help to differentiate uh, adenocystic carcinoma with high grade transformation from uh, salivary duct carcinoma in these cases. Um, additionally, study has shown that adenocystic carcinoma high-grade transformation is aggressive and even more aggressive than uh, solid adenocystic, and some studies have shown that it may increase the risk of lymph node metastases in this tumor. At the molecular level, uh, adenocystic carcinoma is characterized of myb nfib fusion gene in identified more than 50% of adenocystic carcinoma, not only in salivary gland, but uh, in other uh, non-salivary gland sites such as breast, uh, uh, lung, and uh, skin. In 5%, uh, myb uh, uh, mybl one fusion uh, was, uh, is identified, and as, uh, around 50% of adenocystic carcinoma can show a notch one mutation, and it's been reported that adenocystic carcinoma with notch uh, one mutation uh, are more aggressive compared to uh, uh, notch one negative tumors. There is an immunostain for MYB. It's a nuclear stain that stains the myoepithelial cells and is identified in uh, more than 70% of adenocystic carcinoma. However, it doesn't seem to be uh, specific in detecting the fusion gene, and uh, it's also not that specific as a diagnostic marker, as we uh, saw this uh, stain positive in other uh, salivary gland uh, type. Recently, uh, in situ hybridization for the MYB has been described to, be, to have higher uh, specificity and sensitivity uh, compared to the immunostain. However, in our hand, we don't see uh, this specific enough to use it as a diagnostic marker. 
uh, the differential diagnosis of adenoid cystic carcinoma is broad and includes many entities. Uh, when the tumor is conventional, and especially tubular adenoid cystic can look similar to epithelial myoepithelial carcinoma, especially in small material. In a resection, this uh, multinodular growth pattern we see in epithelial myoepithelial with the compact architecture with the epi myoepithelial unit we talked about and this like small scans, hyalinized stroma in between uh, can help to differentiate uh, epithelial myoepithelial carcinoma from adenoid cystic. Uh, additionally, uh, like cribriform pattern, which can be seen in uh, epithelial myoepithelial carcinoma. Uh, however, it's uh, usually uh, focal and not diffuse as we uh, usually uh, see it in adenoid cystic carcinoma. As I mentioned, uh, and as we saw before, like uh, epithelial myoepithelial carcinoma can have uh, the RASQ61R uh, mutation in uh, around 60% of the cases and the immunostain uh, for the uh, RAS can be quite helpful differentiated, uh, differentiating epithelial myoepithelial carcinoma from adenoid cystic carcinoma. Because of the basaloid morphology, uh, basal cell adenocarcinoma can also mimic adenoid cystic carcinoma, especially uh, again small uh, material and resection uh, like uh, the, uh, the compact architecture with this like uh, juxtaposal and uh, trabecular pattern uh, had to differentiate a basal cell adenocarcinoma from adenoid cystic carcinoma, the palisading periphery, this cellular stroma we uh, talk about uh, are all helpful differentiating uh, this tumor from adenoid cystic carcinoma. And as we mentioned in uh, like uh, the trabecular uh, pattern, usually uh, we see this uh, nuclear expression of beta catenin and uh, can be used to differentiate basal cell adenocarcinoma from adenoid cystic uh, carcinoma. Additionally, adenoid cystic carcinoma can mimic non-salivary gland tumor and uh, non-keratinizing or basal squamous cell carcinoma can have the adenoid cystic like uh, uh, pattern and features. Uh, the diffuse positivity for the squamous marker like P40, uh, CK, uh, CK56 and the negative staining for the myoepithelial uh, markers and the absence of the myoepithelial differentiation help to differentiate uh, like squamous cell carcinoma from adenoid cystic carcinoma. In uh, the uh, minor salivary gland sites, especially in uh, sinonasal uh, tract, not carcinoma can uh, mimic uh, solid adenoid cystic carcinoma. Uh, again, here the negativity for the myoepithelial markers and the, in addition, positivity for the not immunostain and not fusion differentiate uh, not carcinoma from adenoid cystic uh, carcinoma. And uh, the entity HPV uh, related polyphenotypic uh, sinonasal carcinoma can look and stain like adenoid cystic carcinoma. So the entity have myoepithelial differentiation as well. So the way to differentiate this entity from, uh, and, uh, from uh, adenoid cystic carcinoma is the HPV stains that are usually positive in, in this entity and the negativity for the MYB fusion. Perhaps the most common uh, differential of adenoid cystic carcinoma is polymorphous adenocarcinoma. Polymorphous adenocarcinoma is rare in major salivary gland. Over 90% of this tumor occurs in minor salivary gland. What's characteris characteristic of this tumor is this uh, like diverse uh, morphology with a different growth pattern, but a uniform cytology. Uh, perineural invasion is common in polymorphous adenocarcinoma, also previously known as polymorphous uh, low-grade adenocarcinoma. Uh, it's important to differentiate polymorphous adenocarcinoma and cystic carcinoma because this tumor has good prognosis with a uh, low uh, rate of uh, local and uh, regional metastases and rare distant metastases. Here we see the different growth pattern of polymorphous adenocarcinoma, tubular, single file, solid, trabecular, uh, cribriform, papillary. Notice the, like, uh, the swirled appearance of this tumor here on low power. The tumor cells have uh, this uh, like tendency to arrange in a targetoid pattern around uh, nerves and vessels. 
But if we look at higher, high power view, we see the tumor cells are very uniform. There's one cell type and has this vesicular like uh, chromatin. We talked so much about papillary thyroid carcinoma. They show papillary thyroid carcinoma like nuclear features. Uh, uh, um, papillary patterns, one of the uh, controversial pattern in uh, diagnosing polymorphous adenocarcinoma. It's been reported that tumor with more than focal papillary formation uh, have the cap capacity to uh, behave more aggressively than uh, compared to conventional classical polymorphous adenocarcinoma. Cribriform pattern is another uh, controversial pattern in diagnosing uh, polymorphous adenocarcinoma. And in 1999, Mihail and Skalova and their colleague, they described cribriform adenocarcinoma of the base of tongue and reported uh, this, uh, this tumor to be uh, more aggressive compared to uh, conventional polymorphous uh, adenocarcinoma, more tendency for uh, lymph node metastases. The same group described uh, cribriform adenocarcinoma in other sites of uh, minor salivary gland, calling this cribriform adenocarcinoma of minor salivary gland. And it has been a lot of debate whether cribriform adenocarcinoma is a subtype of polymorphous adenocarcinoma or a separate entity. Histologically, uh, cribriform adenocarcinoma is characterized by a cribriform and solid uh, growth pattern. Uh, with a nodular-like pattern and fibrous septation between the nodule. You can see palisade in periphery in this tumor. And uh, you also can see this artificial cleft uh, giving the tumor this glomeroid appearance. Similar to conventional polymorphous adenocarcinoma, if you go on high power, the tumor look uh, very uniform. The tumor cells have the optical uh, uh, clearing of the nuclei, as we see here. This here, uh, we see a case of cribriform adenocarcinoma. Notice uh, uh, like the nodular uh, pattern with the fibrous septation. Here uh, we see this uh, small cleft uh, artifact with a glomeroid appearance. Uh, and uh, we see the cribriform pattern. Blood lakes uh, are common in this tumor. But imagine we put a needle in this tumor and uh, we have a biopsy from this tumor. It would be hard to differentiate it from adenocystic carcinoma, right? But as we said before, adenocystic carcinoma is a biphasic tumor. So you see the duct and the myoepithelial differentiation here, whereas polymorphous adenocarcinoma and cribriform adenocarcinoma is composed of one cell type. And uh, often they show this uh, also uh, avoid open uh, uh, vesicular chromatin, whereas adenocystic carcinoma is more basaloid, and you see the hyperchromatic uh, angulated myoepithelial cells. Um, additionally, even in the absence of uh, solid growth, you often see some mitotic activity and apoptosis in adenocystic carcinoma, whereas cribriform adenocarcinoma is uh, typically uh, ha has a low uh, grade cytology. Uh, additionally, if we go back to this uh, picture, notice that cribriform adenocarcinoma has more compact architecture compared to conventional polymorphous adenocarcinoma and also compared to adenocystic carcinoma, and this can be used uh, to differentiate cribriform adenocarcinoma from adenocystic carcinoma. By immunohistochemistry, both cribriform adenocarcinoma and conventional polymorphous adenocarcinoma showed similar immunophenotype. They're diffusely positive for S100 CK7. Adenocystic carcinoma shows variable staining for S100. CD117 stain usually the ductal part of adenocystic carcinoma. In cribriform adenocarcinoma, polymorphic adenocarcinoma, it may have a variable staining. It can be focal or negative. Um, there is a unique uh, staining pattern of P63 and P40 in uh, polymorphous adenocarcinoma and cribriform adenocarcinoma. The P63 usually largely or diffusely positive, whereas P40 is negative. Whereas in adenocystic carcinoma, uh, the P63 and P40 usually show similar staining pattern. Uh, and they usually highlight the myoepithelial cells in addition to other markers like calponin and SMA and help to, by, uh, to highlight the biphasic pattern adenocystic carcinoma. In cribriform adenocarcinoma, polymorphous adenocarcinoma, calponin and SMA typically uh, focal or patchy. 
here we see the, uh, the diffuse positivity of CK7 and S100 in uh, polymorphous adenocarcinoma and cribriform adenocarcinoma. Notice in adenocystic carcinoma, the SMA and uh, the CAM 5.2 highlight the biphasic uh, pattern of this tumor, which, uh, ha which is helpful to differentiate it from uh, polymorphous adenocarcinoma and cribriform adenocarcinoma. Um, here uh, we see the positivity of P6C3 in uh, uh, cribriform adenocarcinoma and polymorphous adenocarcinoma, whereas P40 is negative. In adenocystic carcinoma, both P63 and P40 stay in the peripheral myoepithelial cells. Um, we did a study in 2017 on the predictors of outcome, what we call a phenotypic spectrum of polymorphous adenocarcinoma and cribriform adenocarcinoma. And we found that architecture matters in this tumor. And finally, more 10% uh, or more papillary formation and 30% more cribriform pattern were significant independent predictor of outcome. Uh, therefore, we suggest to recognize these pattern and to report the percentage of papillary pattern and cribriform pattern in, in, in these tumors. Additionally, in this study, we find two cases of classic typical cribriform adenocarcinoma in major salivary glands. So this uh, tumor, cribriform adenocarcinoma, is not limited to minor salivary gland site. At the molecular level, uh, both cribriform adenocarcinoma and polymorphous adenocarcinoma show a molecular alteration in the same family gene, the PRKD family gene. However, majority of classic conventional polymorphous adenocarcinoma show a point mutation in PRKD1, whereas uh, the, uh, most of cribriform adenocarcinoma showed a fusion gene involving PRKD1, 2, 3. Uh, in a study we did on this tumor, we found that regardless of the architecture, the presence of PRK diffusion seems to have a uh, correlation with high risk of nodal metastasis. So molecular testing uh, in this tumor may provide prognostic uh, information regarding lymph node metastasis. Uh, to investigate uh, further whether uh, these two tumors are separate or the same entity, we did this international study where we distributed digitalized a slide of uh, uh, 48 cases of spectrum of this tumor to uh, 25 uh, head and neck pathologists. And we asked the pathologists to uh, classify this tumor to three categories, conventional polymorphous adenocarcinoma, conventional cribriform adenocarcinoma, and tumor in between with indeterminate morphology. Interestingly, even among expert head and neck pathologists, like the intra uh, observer agreement uh, was only fair to moderate, and a good subset of these tumor, 25-30%, were classified as tumor with indeterminate histologic features showing overlapping features between polymorphous adenocarcinoma and cribriform adenocarcinoma. And this reflects the controversies uh, regarding classif the classification of this tumor. Also in this study, we found that tumor with papillary architectures uh, are part of the spectrum. And when papillary architecture predominates, this tumor shows PRK diffusion similar to a cribriform adenocarcinoma. Uh, the current WHO of 2022 lists the cribriform adenocarcinoma under the polymorphous uh, adenocarcinoma. However, the debate's still going on. Uh, the way we think about it, uh, we think about uh, this tumor uh, as a spectrum of morphology and uh, molecular, where at one end, you see the conventional cribriform adenocarcinoma with the hot spot mutation, and the, on the other hand, you see the cribriform adenocarcinoma and the tumor with predominant papillary pattern with the PRK diffusion, and in the middle, you see the tumors with overlapping morphology and molecular alterations. Okay, moving to mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Mucoepidermoid carcinoma is the most common malignant salivary gland tumors in both children and adults. Uh, interestingly, similar to pleomorphic adenoma, prior exposure uh, to radiation has been reported to increase the risk of mucoepidermoid carcinoma. 
This tumor is most commonly seen in a major salivary gland uh, with a, a parotid a predominate. Around 35% of uh, mucoepidermoid carcinoma occurs in minor salivary gland, and um, it can happen rarely centrally in involving a mandible and maxilla. Histologically, this tumor is composed of three cell types, the epidermoid cells that uh, uh, have abundant isonophilic cytoplasm, and they look squamoid, they look similar to the epidermoid or the squamous surface, and the mucocytes uh, that uh, show abundant uh, mucin, intracellular mucin, and they can have signet ring or columnar morphology, often lining the cystic spaces, and the inter intermediate cells which are kind of similar to epidermoid cells, but they have more immature appearance with less uh, cytoplasm. There are different variants of mucoepidermoid carcinoma, and uh, knowing these variants help you to uh, avoid misdiagnosing this tumor. So oncocytic variant is a, a variant that shows extensive oncocytic cells, and finding the uh, other type of cells of mucoepidermoid carcinoma help to differentiate this variant from other onco oncocytic uh, tumors. Uh, Sclerosing variant is uh, characterized by central uh, sclerotic stroma and uh, uh, this uh, atrophic gland. Uh, it's a relatively a well-defined uh, variant and often shows peripheral uh, lymphoid stroma. Other mucoepidermoid uh, variant uh, include a clear cell variant, spindle cell variant, and Warthin-like uh, variant where the tumor shows uh, uh, cystic changes and lymphoid stroma mimicking a Warthin uh, tumor. This lymphoid stroma is very common in mucoepidermoid carcinoma. We saw it m like in the study we did more than 50% of the cases. And this should not be misdiagnosed as lymph node metastasis. I've, I've seen cases like honing these as a lymph node metastasis. Great in mucoepidermoid carcinoma. <laughs> Grade myco, uh, like often we grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma uh, uh, using three-tier grading system to low, intermediate, and, and high grade. And this is important because study has shown that the survival rate is different uh, depending on the grading system. Uh, furthermore, the patients are treated uh, differently uh, depending on, on the grades of the tumor. With low-grade tumors treated often with surgical resection alone, whereas high-grade tumor in addition to the uh, surgery, the patient required uh, adjuvant radiation and neck dissection, and there is no clear cut on how to treat intermediate grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma, perhaps reflecting the, the controversies on how we grade this tumor. So how we grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma? There are different uh, grading system, APIP, Brandwine, Healy, the MSKCC, so it depends on how, which grading uh, system you use. The FIP grading system, it's a popular grading system. It's a point-based grading system as assigned different points to different histologic parameters that are found to correlate with outcome. These parameters are uh, intracystic component less than 20%, two points, neural invasion, two point, uh, mitosis, four or more percent, high power field, three point, necrosis, three point, and anaplasia, uh, four points. And depending on the some of these points, the tumor are graded to low grade if they have zero to four point, intermediate five to six, and high grade uh, with seven and more points. A few years after, Dr. Brandwine uh, like, uh, uh, proposed her grading system. Uh, it's also a point-based grading system. Uh, she added few other parameters, changed the, um, the intracystic component less than 25%, and they added the uh, tumor invasion pattern in small nest and island, lymphovascular invasion, and bony invasion. Although this is a point-based uh, grading system, you don't need to memorize any of these numbers. Low grade has none of these flat parameters. Intermediate has one, and if you have more than one parameter, is high grade using this grading system. There is a grading system called a uh, Healy uh, grading system. It's not a point-based grading system. It's more a qualitative, descriptive grading system. I made it a bit more simple here for you in the table, but it's, it's a descriptive, uh, like, uh, grading system calling low-grade uh, tumor when the tumors are cystic, uh, showing macrocysts, mac uh, microcysts, and abundant, uh, like, a mucocyte with pools of extravasated mucin, 
a minimal pleomorphism, rare mitosis, and well-defined border. We, the intermediate grades usually solid, and they have mild to moderate pleomorphism, some mitosis, and uh, invasive, uh, poorly uh, circumscribed border. Whereas high grade, they're predominantly solid. They have uh, poorly differentiated epidermoid and intermediate cells with some pleom marked pleomorphism and uh, mitotic activity, perineural invasion, and vascular invasion, and uh, uh, less peripheral uh, chronic inflammation. So it's a very descriptive uh, grading system as we see. And it has been reported there are problems with this uh, grading system. Although the FIP grading system uh, is a popular uh, uh, grading system, it seems to downgrade MUCOEP and sometimes fail to predict indolent force for low-grade uh, tumors. Uh, whereas Brentline grading system uh, tends to upgrade MUCOEP and uh, may categorize some of the indolent tumor as high-grade, resulting, resulting in unnecessary treatment for uh, these tumor. The uh, system, on the other hand, is very descriptive and ambiguous, which makes it uh, subjective. To illustrate this uh, further, I'm going to review with you three cases. So case number one, as you see, is spericystic and mucinous. And I can say that, tell you there's no mitotic activities, no necrosis, no perineural invasion. So how do we grade this case? Low grade? Okay. So here it doesn't really matter, it doesn't make any difference. Any grading system you want, this is a low grade tumor. Let's see case number two. Case number two is solid, has pleomorphism, increased mitotic activity, perineural invasion, tumor necrosis, and vascular invasion. Ah, yeah, same here. Using any grading system you want, this is a high grade mucoepidermal carcinoma. Let's see case number three. So case number three is solid. You see here some interspersed mucosite and has perineural invasion. So how do we grade this tumor? Who says low grade? Who says high grade? High grade? Who says intermediate? Intermediate. So you can see there are differences. It actually depends on which grading system you use. So if you use like FIP grading system, there are two points for solid, two points for perineural invasion. So that's four points, that's still low grade. If you use red wine grading system, there are two bad parameters. So it's more than one bad parameter, it's high grade. You can see that there's big difference between uh, like these two grading system. Here, on the other hand, it's kind of subjective. You can go intermediate, but if you think, oh, this is, has like very little uh, mucosite and there's perineural, you can call it high, high grade. To study this further and to, to uh, investigate the grading of MUCOEP, in 2014, we did a study where we compared different grading system and we found all grading system to correlate with outcome. However, we found no consensus in 44% of the cases, and some tumor called high grade using brand one, but low grade using FIP, similar to case number three. Also, we found in this study that there's a correlation between mitosis, necrosis, and outcome. So we decided to use mitosis and necrosis to define high grade in a grading system we call MSK grading system. In this grading system, we did not include perineural invasion, vascular invasion, or bony invasion. In our opinion, these are more like staging or micro-staging or independent parameter. We usually don't use them to grade other tumor. And so using MSK grading system, we call high grade when the tumor has four or more uh, mitosis per 10 high power field or tumor necrosis. And typically these tumor are solid and infiltrative. We call low grade when the tumor mostly cystic and uh, well, with well-defined border has no or one mitotic activity and no necrosis. And intermediate grade, they're predominantly solid or infiltrative, showing less than four uh, mitosis per 10 hyperfield and no necrosis. The current WHO uh, 
mention the three grading system FIP, Brandwine, and MSK without the endorsement of any of these grading system. And they went descriptively uh, calling low grade tumors uh, like uh, as tumor that are usually circumscribed uh, par uh, and partly cystic and contains groups of mucocyte, intermediate uh, mucoepidermoid carcinoma are generally more solid, while the high grade are solid with less mucocytes and may display nuclear feature, mitotic activity, necrosis with perineural lymphovascular and bone invasion. So they went descriptively. However, they acknowledge that low grade and intermediate grade behave in a similar way. And we confirmed this in a recent study we did on mucoepidermoid carcinoma, where we found low grade and, uh, and intermediate grade to behave in a similar fashion in terms of uh, risk for lymph node metastases, recurrence, and distant metastases. So in this recent study, we actually propose a two-tiered uh, modified grading system, calling a high grade when the tumor has four or more uh, mitotic activity per 10 high power field and or tumor necrosis, and low grade when the tumor has less than four uh, mitosis per 10 high power field and no tumor necrosis. And we found this two-tier grading system to be a significant and independent predictor of recurrence in a multivariant analysis. Uh, right now, we still use the three-tier grading system at uh, MSK. I think uh, uh, more uh, validation studies are, are uh, needed to uh, validate these two-tier grading system, but so far when we propose this to our clinician, they love it, they hate intermediate grade, they don't know what to do in intermediate grade, and uh, I think, uh, uh, yeah, this will be, uh, I think uh, if we have more study, we maybe can push for this uh, in the next uh, WHO. At the molecular level, um, like uh, more than 60% of mucoepidermoid carcinoma characterized by CRTC1 MAM A2 uh, effusion, and it's been reported that uh, there's uh, more predilection of this fusion in the, uh, low grade and intermediate grade compared to uh, high grade. The differential diagnosis of mucoepidermoid carcinoma includes several entities, and we're gonna go over this uh, like in the slide session. A synex cell carcinoma. A synex cell carcinoma is characterized by a serous acinar differentiation. It is most commonly seen in major salivary gland, it's rare in minor uh, salivary gland. Uh, and we always think about a synex cell carcinoma, the tumor that has zymogen granule and is very similar to the uh, normal acini in the parotid gland. However, the spectrum of a synex cell carcinoma is broad and not limited only the typical acinar cells. So you can see different growth patterns and different uh, cell types in a synex cell carcinoma. The cell types include acinar cell, which is the essential and diagnostic uh, cells in a synex cell carcinoma. They are uh, characterized by eccentric uniform nuclei with uh, basophilic cytoplasm filled with dimension granules. Other cell types, including uh, um, uh, intercalated duct uh, cells, where the cells usually uh, seen surrounding lumen with eosinophilic cytoplasm and more uh, central nuclei. When you see vacuoles in uh, intercalated duct cells, we call them vacuolated cells. They can have show they can show different size and shapes of vacuoles. And the least common cells is non-specific glandular cells, where the cells uh, look uh, more sensitial with less uh, cell borders. The growth pattern includes solid or nested growth pattern, which is the most common growth pattern seen in a synex cell carcinoma. The second most common is microcystic pattern. You can see follicles with secretion and uh, papillary and cystic formation. Similar to uh, mucoepidermoid carcinoma, uh, lymphoistroma is common in uh, a synex cell carcinoma, and again, this should not be misinterpreted as nodal metastasis. Um, Majority of SNX cell carcinoma are low-grade indolent tumor. However, they can have high-grade form and uh, they may show aggressive behavior. Recently, uh, translocation T49 involving upstream region of a transcriptor factor N4A3 uh, have, have, via a hijacking mechanism has been described 
in SNX cell carcinoma. And there is an immunostain for this, uh, like uh, for the N N4A3, we call it NOR1, uh, and it's a nuclear immunostain that uh, we've, like we and other people found a very uh, specific, highly specific and sensitive and, and uh, sensitive and specific for SNX cell carcinoma, superior to uh, dog one uh, immunostain. Okay, let's see what you think of this case. We have a tumor with cystic and papillary formation, eosinophilic and baculated cells, and microcystic and follicular pattern. Let us see. Any other options, I think? What if I, I tell you we are in the breast, not in the salivary gland, <laughs> but it is a secretory carcinoma of the breast. So in 2010, uh, Scalopa and her colleague described mammary analog secretory carcinoma of the salivary gland, a tumor that uh, morph shows uh, morphologic and genetic similarities with secretory carcinoma of the breast. It harbors the same translocation, the ATP6 and TRAC3 uh, uh, fusion. Uh, in uh, 2017, they changed uh, the name to secretory carcinoma, as I, uh, I think people think uh, the secretory carcinoma of the breast may be a salivary gland type rather than the salivary gland being a mammary analog. So what about this tumor before 2010. Do we have this tumor? Did it exist? How did we call it? Yeah, very good. So before that, most of these, let's say, were diagnosed as SNX cell carcinoma. And because of the overlapping cell type and morphology that I showed you before. However, in secretory carcinoma, the zymogen and garganial are absent. So secretory carcinoma is uh, uh, histologically is composed of these eosinophilic cells uh, with vacillation, and they can show different growth pattern, microcysts, microcyst, uh, with tubules and uh, follicles and intraluminal secretions. And now we know that papillary cystic pattern actually likely a growth pattern of secretory carcinoma and not SNX cell carcinoma. This pattern shows a cystic formation with biopsy-like changes, degenerative type of changes, papillary, uh, floating papillary formation, hobnailing. By immunostain, secretory carcinoma shows a diffuse positivity for S100, CK7, can be positive mammoglobin and breast 2, and usually is positive for GATA3, uh, whereas the tumor negative for AR, DOG1, NOR1, and P63 and P40. Uh, typically, it's a critical carcinoma indolent tumor, but can have capacity of high grade. Um, when the tumor is high grade or when it recurs and becomes aggressive, it might be very important at that point to recognize it as secretory carcinoma because the patient might benefit from the therapeutic option with TRAC inhibitors. Differential diagnosis of secretory carcinoma because of the pink cytoplasm, the secretions, the cystic formation, it might mimic uh, uh, mucoepidermoid carcinoma. The presence of the squamous cells and the, the, the mucocytes, along with the positivity for the squamous marker and the negative stain for S100, differentiate uh, like secretory carcinoma from mucoepidermoid uh, carcinoma. Intraductal carcinoma uh, is a tumor that's characterized by ductal proliferation surrounded by myoepithelial cells. Can look also like a secretory carcinoma. The, the, uh, presence of the myoepithelial cells, which can be highlighted by immunohistochemistry, differentiate uh, intraductal carcinoma from uh, secretory carcinoma. And salivary carcinoma, uh, NOS, it's really the diagnosis of exclusion. And before you make this diagnosis, you have to make sure it doesn't, it's not like secretory carcinoma or other specific types of salivary gland type carcinoma. Okay, what do you think of this case? I hear SNX, yeah. Yeah, what give it away B cells, right? The arsenal cell with zymogen and granule. But if you have biopsy from here, it can be quite difficult to tell if this is SNX or secretory carcinoma. So the main differential of secretory carcinoma is SNX cell carcinoma. 
In secretory carcinoma, we, we see like most commonly the papillary cystic pattern, tubular, microcystic, follicular pattern. In SNX carcinoma, the solid and the microcystic pattern are more common. And zymogen granules with acinar cells are absent uh, in secretory carcinoma. In SNX cell carcinoma, these cells are diagnostic and essential to make the diagnosis. Vaculated cells are more common in secretory carcinoma. And as we said before, by immunostains, it not, it's usually uh, easy to differentiate these two tumors as uh, secretory carcinoma diffusely positive for CK7 and S100, and positive for GATA3, uh, breast 2 and mammoglobin negative for NOR1, and can have uh, negative or focal positivity for DOG1. Uh, in SNX cell carcinoma, S100 usually negative, CK7 can be variable, but often is not diffuse. And uh, same with mama globin and uh, breast 2, they can have variable staining, but often not diffuse. GATA3 is focal or negative, but this tumor usually shows diffuse positivity, dog one. Sox stain here can be positive, so don't do only sox stain when you're trying to differentiate these two entities. Do S100 as well. And uh, NOR1, which is the new uh, marker, is actually very helpful and is uh, like highly specific and sensitive for uh, SNX cell carcinoma. And in difficult cases, you always can do uh, molecular testing. So in the last part of uh, this talk, I'm gonna uh, like talk briefly about the update in the first edition of the WHO. So there are some updates on benign tumors, uh, like entities uh, such as keratocystoma, intercalated duct adenoma, striated duct adenoma were added to the uh, current WHO, and sclerosing polycystic adenosis now is called poly uh, sclerosing polycystic adenoma in view of its neoplastic nature. But I'm gonna focus more on the update on the malignant uh, tumor. As mentioned, uh, cribriform adenocarcinoma is uh, mentioned uh, under the polymorphous adenocarcinoma chapter. And there is a brief update on uh, intraductal carcinoma. We'll go over this. There are three uh, new entities added to the WHO, sclerosing microcystic adenocarcinoma, microsecretory adenocarcinoma, and mucinous adenocarcinoma. And the oncocytic carcinoma, which was uh, a separate entity in the, two w, uh, in the WHO of 2017, now is listed under uh, salivary carcinoma NOS as an emerging entity. Microsecretory adenocarcinoma, newly recognized uh, entity, um, so far less than 30 uh, cases ha 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 have been reported. This tumor has a tendency to occur in oral uh, cavity uh, uh, with palate and buccal mucosa being the most affected site. One case was reported in the uh, parotid gland, perineural invasion is rare, and what's been reported so far uh, showed that this tumor is indolent, uh, has low-grade cytology, no reported reference or metastases. Histologically, this tumor often has rounded borders with focal infiltration and is composed, uh, it shows this uh, tubules and microcystic pattern is composed of one cell types with these intercalated uh, duct-like cells with flattened or attenuated uh, uh, appearance and is an to clear cytoplasm and hyperchromatic nuclei. Uh, Intra, their intraluminal uh, basophilic uh, secretion and the stroma is fibromyxoid, as we see here. This uh, tumor is uh, characterized by uh, MEF2C SS18 fusion uh, and uh, by immunohistochemical stains, uh, is positive for S100, SOX10, and P63, but negative for P40, mammoglobin, calponin, and SMA. Uh, can be focal but uh, or negative. So the immune phenotype uh, quite similar to polymorphous adenocarcinoma, if you notice, uh, as you notice. But uh, morphologically and molecularly, this tumor is different. A sclerosis in microcystic adenocarcinoma is similar to microcystic adenocarcinoma of skin at Nexel. Uh, has tendency to occur in intraoral minor salivary gland site. Is uh, composed of these. Uh, infiltrative uh, tubules and cord and nest embedded in a very sclerotic collagenous uh, stroma. It's a biphasic tumor. 
has ductal and myoepithelial cells, which can be uh, highlighted by the immunostains. Perineural invasion here is common. However, also this tumor shows a uh, low uh, proliferative rate and a good outcome. Nielsen is adenocarcinoma was uh, uh, like uh, listed under adenocarcinoma NOS in the past. Uh, is a tumor that characterized by abundant intracellular and extracellular mucin. It can have variable uh, architecture, papillary, colloid signet ring in 40% shows mixed pattern. It actually looks to, uh, similar to all the like mucinous adenocarcinoma we see in other site, uh, uh, non-salivary gland site. It's only positive for CK7 and negative for all other marker. What is interesting about this uh, entity, and maybe that's why it's now listed as a separate uh, entity, that it shows recurrent AKT1 mutation. There is a reported cases of what uh, we call intraductal papillary uh, mucinous neoplasm or IPMN of salivary gland that has similarity to IPMN of uh, the pancreas. Uh, it's a lesion that shows papillary and mucinous features with intraductal or cystic uh, uh, features. And um, this um, entity is an emerging entity. It's not listed in the WHO, but it's also reported to have the AKT1 mutation. So uh, people think uh, or like that it's closely related to mucinous adenocarcinoma. Intraductal carcinoma is being called different names. Initially, it was called low-grade salivary duct carcinoma. Then the name changed to low-grade cribriform adenocarcinoma. In 2017, intraductal carcinoma uh, was the term used to this entity. It uh, shows ductal proliferation arranged in cystic and lobules with a different architecture. It has myoepithelial uh, differentiation or myoepithelial uh, peripheral cells. It can be highlighted by P63 and myoepithelial marker. Uh, but this tumor can show variable morphology. There are different subtypes of intraductal carcinoma, intercalated uh, uh, intraductal carcinoma, and oncocytic uh, intraductal carcinoma show the same immunophenotype. They're positive S100 SOX10, but negative for AR. And uh, red fusion and BRAF mutation uh, were reported in this subtype, and typically this subtype has low grade uh, cytology. Here we see uh, uh, the uh, intercalated duct intraductal carcinoma. Uh, the tumor cells here are positive for S100, as we see, and they have uh, cystic and lobular uh, formation. Uh, apocrine uh, intraductal carcinoma shows more apocrine cytology. And this tumor shows positivity for androgen, and negative staining for S100 and SOX10. And it's different at the molecular level than intercalated duct. It has more uh, RAS, PK, P, uh, PIK3CA, and P53 <laughs> mutation, and can show a range of cytologic FCP, ranging from low grade to high grade. So this seems to have more like relation to uh, the salivary duct carcinoma or to breast carcinoma. Um, but to make things complicated, you can see mixed subtypes, mixed morphology and immunophenotype. So it's not like totally separate. And uh, a recent study showed that uh, the same molecular alteration identified in the ductal component and the myoepithelial uh, component. So now we think that this tumor is more biphasic rather than being intraductal in situ. So maybe the name will change again in the next WHO, we'll see. <laughs> Finally, oncocytic carcinoma, uh, which is a tumor uh, that composed mostly of oncocytes, was an entity uh, that was described in, in the past and it was like in a separate, like listed in a separate chapters. Most of these, uh, now we know they represent salivary duct carcinoma with oncocytic features. And uh, right now there is no clear cut and no consensus whether this really, this entity exists or not. It's uh, included in the current WHO as an emerging entity, not as a separate uh, like uh, type. And I think that's all uh, for today. <laughs> Thank you. If not, I think we can go on with the cases then. Thank you. 
please. So this case is kind of well defined and cystic, right? Very cystic. If we go on high power, we see the lining is very denuded and squamous. Maybe their FMA changes. Here we see some mucosite, right? More mucosite here. Some bands and still very cystic. Less cystic here, right? Some squamous and glandular formation. So what's your diagnosis here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, so this is one of the differential of muca epidermoid carcinoma when it's very cystic, like benign, like mucosil or benign duct versus muco -ep. And it can be very difficult, like because let's say you biopsy this area here, where it's very cystic. I, I don't think we can tell really, right, because I think if when you have the whole section, it's always easier. But if we go around, around and we start to see these, I think, area with more complex, especially here, when you start to see this protrusion with a bit of cribber forming, that's very suggestive, in my opinion, of mucoepidermoid carcinoma and uh, can differentiate it, or at least it can make you think of the possibility of muco F versus like benign duct. And I think this, to me, gives it away, this like complex architecture with like a glandular and squamous uh, component and infiltration. But we always expect muco F to be very mucinous. It's not very mucinous, similar to a PA. It can have variety of morphology, so I, I'm gonna also show you different cases of muco -ep. So this is a case of muco -ep that very cystic that has the differential of benign and cystic lesion. Sure. Let's say, uh, I mean, no, not if it was a memorial case, let's say if the patient was from India and this was, uh, sometimes we have patients from India, it's it difficult to get the slides. Yeah. Would you tell them uh, it's muco app, or you would uh, be very careful and do the mammal too. And that's I think we are spoiled. We're lucky. Uh, I, you, yeah, I would do it. I would do it definitely if I don't have the infiltrative area. Like when I see cystic muco app, and like even if I favor muco app and I start to see this protrusion, I we do the, the the fish. But even for this, I would do it. Yeah, I would do it. Yeah, but it's. I think the the, the more solid area. It's uh, like. It's consistent with the muco -ep. This would be the extent of the mammal to the amazing part. Yes, <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. I think we did it on this one, and it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah, because at first, you start, bec when you look around, we start to see that it's a bit more complex than typical mucosil. Mucosil is like, as usually it has like lining that is very, could be denuded or absent, uh, but it's a simple lining. And uh, this simple, but then when you look around, you start to see gland in the wall or the protrusion with a bit co of crib reforming. I think that's a bit uh, like uh, suspicious. Yeah. The area of the top, yeah, it's diagnosed. That's too much for, for uh, like benign cystic structure. Sorry, I, I, just to come back to the mammal yeah. too. So let's say uh, you were with pathologists without borders, I don't know, in the refugee camp in Thailand, you wouldn't 
send this to Memorial, right? You would make the diagnosis on H&E or no? Yeah, yeah. if I have to, yes. I would. Ah, okay. yeah, yeah. We, 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 I think whatever is accessible, we try our best. It, like we're spoiled, we use everything we can. But yeah, if I don't have the, the, the mammal 2 or the, 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 the cytogenetic test, I would call it. Uh, would you agree? Uh, do you accept uh, um, keratin pairs in multiple dermoid carcinoma? Yeah, very good questions. I uh, I do, but it's usually focal, not like diffuse. Uh, and if it's otherwise consistent with MycoEP, yes. But I use it also to differentiate squamous from MycoEP because it's not a common feature. So when you see a lot of keratinization, like extracellular keratin, that's like not typical of MucoF. So in addition to pleomorphism and like dysplasia or in situ, we, we use it as a feature to favor adenosquamous and squamous. Uh, however, it can be seen usually focal. Actually, we see it more in pleomorphic adenoma compared to MucoF, the, the extracellular uh, keratin and uh, squamous pearl. But uh, if it's otherwise uh, okay and consistent with MucoF, I think, and it's focal, I think it's uh, okay. I've seen maybe rare cases with, with squamous pearl that we call it. But a another thing that maybe, uh, there is a paper published in by uh, colleagues of ours uh, on um, cases of uh, unicystic mucopidermoid carcinoma, all with long-term follow-up, all, all of them going very well. Mm -hmm. So they say, they propose that this unicystic mech can be indeed the kind of in situ carcinoma and not indeed invasive. I don't know. I think in, in salivary gland, uh, uh, yeah, it's hard to, uh, we don't have like enough evidence to say that these always behave well. Uh, and uh, we like, uh, we call adenoma or in situ, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I think we need more study to show that these, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to call these benign because uh, we've seen few cases with lymph node meds uh, that are low grade or uh, like especially intermediate if one lump them together and sometimes it depends on the location like tumor in the oropharynx seems to have more tendency so we see very small uh, like uh, like benign looking muco app like rarely but i think it can be happen so I, I i would be careful Personally, I think we need more data before we call something, to, especially we call pleomorphic adenoma benign and it recurs. So people yeah. might call these low-grade malignancy benign. They, they maybe don't have much worse prognosis than pleomorphic adenoma, but uh, yeah, I would, I would be maybe careful. I think we need more data. Yes, we, we have a patient with a well-differentiated grade one, low-grade mucopidermoid carcinoma of the oral cavity that was not completely excised, so she refused the, the um, second surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, at the moment, she was clinically and radiologically free of disease, so she, she denied the, the, the permission to go on. But then after seven or two, eight years, she went back to the whole neck, full down metastasis. So yeah. I, I think that's a carcinoma, I agree with you. It's yeah. low grade, but we, do, we must do all our efforts to treat and at least surgically remove it. What's your diagnosis here? This is easier. <coughs> MucoEP. Yeah, this is more conventional MucoEP with abundant mucocyte, intermediate cells. We can find um, more epidermoid cells probably here. Right. And uh, <coughs> this one is mostly cystic, so I think people will call this low grade. Notice the lymphoistroma. It's actually quite helpful. We have a recent case where we thought about MucoEP just because it has <laughs> lymphoidstroma. So it can be quite helpful. Um, yeah, very tricky on uh, fine needle aspiration cytology. Mm -hmm, definitely, yeah. yeah. This one is more infiltrative and uh, it's kind of cases that we called uh, intermediate grade because it 
has infiltration. I think it has maybe perineural somewhere. And it's uh, at the margin, as you see here. So the problem is intermediate. When it's at the margin, they might be more aggressive. And uh, yeah, I think it has perineural. Let's see if I can put you here. Maybe not. But yeah, but this, if you find the perineural, is this kind of cases where it might be called high grade if you use Brandwine and uh, system, but low grade FIP, we call it intermediate. So you can see that it can be graded differently depending on, on the grading system you use. Also, there's some lymphoid stroma in this case. Oh, here we see the perineural found it. But when you evaluate a radical excision, do you have a limit? On, uh, um, I mean, do you measure, measure the margin? How do you consider a uh, safe margin? Yeah, I, I think we... Uh, we usually comment on the, like, if it's focal versus, like, passive in large areas. Uh, I think it's, they put it together with other parameters. So if the tumor is low grade, I don't know, they might go back and try to clean the margin instead of giving radiation. And depends on other parameters, the age and, like, uh, other th clinical parameter. If it's high grade, they will maybe, like, do radiation any any uh, anyway? So I think that it's they, it depends, but we do comment on if we see it very focal versus like like a large uh, large front, we we comment on that. This is an example with more solid growth of uh, MIFO F. Uh, the reason I want to show you the solid uh, growth because, as I mentioned before, many people think of MucoApp as a very cystic and mucinous, and these solid growth, even I think if if they are kind of indolent or more closer to low grade than like high grade, but uh, I think uh, it helps to recognize them as part of the spectrum of MucoApp to prevent uh, misdiagnosing uh, these cases. about this case. Let's see. Show you. This is high grade, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Why is not squamous? Let me show you like uh, some area with necrosis. Let's see if we all agree there's necrosis and there mitotic activity. But yeah, here I think so yeah, it is a high grade micro app. So the notice that we don't have much keratinization, but imagine you have like biopsy with this basaloid area here. It, it would be difficult. So again, we use this feature to differentiate high grade micro app from uh, like uh, adenosquamous and squamous including keratinization. So as you see in this case, is although it's high grade, we don't see keratinization. Uh, uh, the, if you are in minor salivary gland, the presence of dysplasia or in situ carcinoma uh, favor the diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma and adenosquamous. And I also what I find quite helpful that even in high grade tumor of MUCOEP, notice there is no pleo like significant ugly cytology or pleomorphism. So they do have this monotony, all these uh, salivary tumors or in general tumors with a translocation. So also that's a hint that it's maybe not squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, keratinization, often you don't see keratinization in, in MUCOF. Okay. Let's look closer at this. kind of well-defined. Has some glandular formation. Any idea? I 
think you can be a salivary gland pathology. No? <laughs> yeah. So it looks like mucoepidermoid carcinoma. No, actually it is, it is. This is the sclerosing, you're right. <laughs> this is the sclerosing variant of mucoepidermoid carcinoma. So uh, notice the, this like dense collagenous trauma. What's interesting about this variant, which can be sometimes like interesting that the glands are very atrophic. So we don't always see mucosite, but these are glandular and uh, basal squamous cells. So if you do stains here, you see that these are biphasic, although they look very denuded. So they can have these atrophic uh, changes, and it's co very common to see lymphoid stroma. So it doesn't look like typical mucoep, but it is a, a mucoep uh, carcinoma. Uh, when we use three-tier grading system, it's actually difficult to, to, uh, to grade this uh, variant because how do you grade this? Is it infiltrative? Is it solid? Is it cystic? What is, is cystic? So with two-tier grading system, we did include the variant because it's easier. You, can, you don't have to comment on architecture as much. It's just mitosis, necrosis. So this represents a sclerosing variant of mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Yeah. They, they, they should be very difficult to differentiate from uh, wart and tumors, oh, the, especially yeah, on uh, preoperative yeah, definitely. cytology. Yeah, so if we have, so this is wart and like mucoepidermoid carcinoma, and again with salivary gland, when you have the resection, look at everything, because you might see keys here and there. But on small material, you have to think about everything because you might not see everything that you need to make the diagnosis. So you have to have a broad differential. And that's why sometimes we're limited. We cannot make the diagnosis. But when we think about all the possibility, at least we don't call it like under -call or over -call. So this is a Wharton-like uh, mucoep. As you see, it's very cystic and has uh, lymphoid stroma everywhere. Um, and if we could look at the lining, it can be oncocytic and it can be very actually, uh, like as we see here, it has this columnar like uh, appearance with basal layer that we see typically in uh, uh, Wharton, although Wharton may be a bit more oncocytic, but it can look like Wharton, definitely. People use P63 also to differentiate these two entities. As here, if you see P63, you see more stratification, whereas in Wharton tumor, you see more uh, simple like basal layer. So that's one way to uh, help you differentiate these two. And as I said, I usually look around, see when we see more stratification or more solid areas like this. You don't see usually this like glands with protrusion from the cyst, this is more characteristic or suggestive at least of mucoepidermoid carcinoma. When you have the resection, area like these are very helpful and even here I think this has more typical area. I have the same question, uh, would you find out this without the mammal tube? With this area yeah, I would, but without this area I would do mammal tube. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I have another question. This is a very tricky case, case and in general, a very dif difficult problems because you know that they've been described watching tumor with the mammal two translocation. Yes, yeah. So what do you feel that? Yeah, and to make it more complicated, you can see squamous metaplasia and mucosite in watching tumor. However, I'm not sure, I know it's reported, but this based on the initial really descriptions of the mammal 2 and I don't think there are recent data on uh, mammal 2 uh, in uh, warthen like mucoep or in, uh, I'm sorry, in warthen tumor, pure mucoep. So I wonder, like, because we I don't, didn't see the case, I wonder this, if this case or the, these cases, I'm not sure, I think maybe a case or two, they are Wharton like mucoep rather than real Wharton tumor. But yeah, I cannot say because I didn't see them, but I don't think there are recent data on this. This uh, was initially described in Wharton tumor. And Can I ask a question? The reverse, the, uh, yes, please. <laughs> no, I wanted the reverse question. Why this cannot be mucopidermoid arising in a Wharton tumor? Uh, yeah, 
I, I think first it's not very, even the area they mimic Wharton, they're not very like classic Wharton. So it has less oncocytic appearance. Second, uh, I usually, I'm not a big fan of hybrid tumors. When I see a typical morphology of a certain entity, I tend to accept more a spectrum of heterogeneity in the same tumor rather than a collision or, yeah, but that's me. I, I, I feel this, this is in like more likely the situation than being a Wharton tumor like with uh, like, uh, like, and we see the transition. That's another way. When you see a transition, I think it helps you to also to put things together and to recognize that it's likely this old one tumor that went to uh, more typical areas. And here, do you see a, a true lymph node? Because usually working tumor, you see the true lymph node with the capsule. Yeah. Well, th this is quite altered by the tumor, but it is difficult to me to recognize the, the, cap the true capsule of the lymph node yeah. and the um, uh, pericapsular sinus. Yeah, I don't. However, I find it sometimes difficult to tell a real lymph node from lymphoid stroma because lymphoid stroma tend to be sometimes very dense around the tumor and they can have pseudo capsule. So I use the same uh, like a criteria for like lymph nodes versus lymphoid we use even in the thyroid versus like Hashimoto uh, versus metastasis, defining the capsule, the subcapsular sinusoid. But it's not always straightforward like because the lymphoid stroma sometimes can be very dense and can have pseudo like fi uh, capsule with fibrosis. But uh, I don't think in this case is a real uh, like a and a final thing that uh, it helps because I make a lot of preoperative diagnosis, so I, I try to climb in on the, on the glasses, and it is the age and if they smoke or not. Because I, I think, of course, you can have working in a no, in young and non-smoker, but it is very difficult. So uh, I, uh, totally, yeah. Patients with Wharton tumor usually older and they're smoker. Yeah, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Related to what. Yeah. Uh, Maria Pia was asking me, I mean, was talking about, uh, uh, you know, three USCAPs ago, uh, uh, I went to a, a salivary gland uh, session and uh, I, I remembered very distinct, it was like a case presentation and Winrobe, the, the pathologist from Toronto, uh, mm -hmm. showed a case uh, that looked like, uh, you know, talking about rearrangements and, and you know, histotypes and the way we classify tumors. Uh, showed a case that, uh, you know, looked like uh, to everybody uh, an ischemic cell carcinoma mm -hmm. and said, you know, this is the classic pattern, he showed it, etc. But mm -hmm. then at the end he said, well, I did uh, fish for mammal to rearrange, but it was rearranged, so I changed my diagnosis <laughs> to uh, 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 mute epidermoid carcinoma. Then I, I was amazed uh, and then after the, the presentation, I went to ask him, so but why did you change the diagnosis? If everything fits for that, you know, histologically, immunohistochemically, why, do you, why don't, didn't you call it uh, 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 ischemic cell carcinoma with mammal to rearrangement? I mean, I think there is, uh, this is a little bit of a ph philosophical thing, but not so much because it has very practical implications. You know, I do molecular pathology for a living. Uh, but yes, uh, but yet I'm mm, mm, mm. kind of very much against, uh, you know, sticking to uh, 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 molecular as the ultimate way of classifying things. So th th to my uh, question, he said, well, I did it because, you know, uh, mammal tour is typical of uh, mute epidermoid carcinoma, and so that wins. I, I don't think it is correct. Probably it would have been better to call it mutipidermoid carcinoma with mammal to rearrangement. I mean, if we, if we change <laughs> the, you know, sorry, so yeah. yes, yes. Uh, uh, if, if we uh, change our histologic yeah. diagnosis, they, we lose information essentially. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree with the philosophical like ideas and the guy, the but he's an expert. Yeah, not, so. yeah, I know what you're talking about. I wasn't there, so I don't know the case. Did it look typical, a cynic, though? 
Because I am aware of that there is a mucoepidermoid carcinoma of, with SNEC differentiation that uh, also can show positivity for NOR1. I, I recently had a case that positive for NOR1 and it has a mammal too, but it didn't look like SNEC. It looked like uh, uh, mucoep. So I ignored actually <laughs> the NOR1 because it's highly sensitive and specific, but it can, in few cases, especially mucoep, can have some positivity. But uh, but I totally agree we should not be slave to molecular immuno. So because also we because, you know, people who don't do molecular yeah. for a living, uh, yeah. uh, they don't know that it's not always uh, you yeah, know, it, yeah uh, it's not black always and white. I mean, black it's and just white. like no. we have, uh, you know, intermediate cases or yeah. difficult cases in histology. They also exist. You know, a, 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 you know, the platforms that we yeah. use are not always the same. So, you know, if there, you know, we always talk about we're very humble as pathologists and very, you know, we always feel guilty that we mm -hmm. are not reproducible enough, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But nobody has ever measured. I mean, this is again philosophical, but yeah, very yeah. relevant. Nobody's yeah. ever measured the reproducibility of, you know, MSK impact with other yeah. platforms of, uh, you know, there, there is a significant lack of, you know, uh, what is the intra and intra observer viability of laboratories in making diagnosis. This goes back as a, as a, as a corollary to what Maria uh, Pia was saying, yeah. meaning, you know, well, why, you know, there have been cases of warting tumor uh, reported with the rearranged yeah. and, and, you know, yeah. Maybe they were really rearranged word in tumors. Uh, that yeah, it's, it's, it's very true. And different tumors can show the same translocation. They're, they're, and we know they are different. So we, I always try to put everything together because I think it's, uh, uh, yeah, for these cases with mucoep with uh, uh, SNEC differentiation, there are few cases reported. I wasn't there, so I don't know how the morphology really looked. But yeah, I, I think I, did they have one case yeah, like this? Like yeah, a cynic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think it's always g good to like not to accept things black and white, like just to, to, to think about all the options, yeah. And uh, since we talked about it, I want to show you a case of Wharton tumor, just to highlight uh, the difference in the typical morphology here of, let's see if I can get this. Yeah, here. See, it, uh, it has more oncocytic typically and more simple, but of course you can, actually this case I can show you has metaplasia in one area, Let's see here, that looks solid with squamous metaplasia and mucocyte, mimicking very closely mucoap. So we did <laughs> mammal two here in was negative. But I, for me, finding typical morphology uh, of Wharton here was helpful with the mammal two negative. I did. We actually showed it around the old case. I don't know if you remember it. And uh, we, we uh, did the mammal too, and then we said we favor this to be Wharton tumor, not, not uh, like a mucoep. Okay, and uh, more of mucoep. This has cystic area, has solid area, and how you describe these cells. Oncocytic, yeah, so this one is an oncocytic variant of mucoep. Uh, this one, huh? yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's a spectrum of the same, the oncocytoid, they can look apocrine, then they, if they're very thin, they, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think it's a spectrum, but it's, uh, it's I think, oncocytic enough. <laughs> you can see a spectrum of uh, oncocytic changes. This one, when we did the study, we noticed this is being reported, but it's also a pitfall because it can have spindle cell. So the intermediate cells, if we call these intermediate, they really can have different morphology. They can have oncocytic feature, they can have spindle, foamy, so they don't look always very squamous. So I find 
like um, like uh, I find like uh, the the uh, knowledge or the like looking at a different example and knowing the different variety and variants of any entities, including UCOF, helpful to avoid uh, misdiagnoses. So the, the, the intermediate, there is a spindle variant of uh, MUCOEP and it can, the, the cells can look quite spindle as you see here. And in this case, mm -hmm. the, um, the mammal too can be helpful? In these cases? Do you think that? I think so, but because it's otherwise typical, like, Yes, but the, right? the, the problem is always in uh, fine needle aspiration yeah. and in, in seasonal biopsies. Uh, fine needle yes. aspiration and, and small biopsy, definitely. Like we, we do it all the time on our cytology cases. On yeah, When you have the whole case, is always different. You can see like typical area, but uh, totally on, on this case, if it's a biopsy with spindle cell, I would do <laughs> the... Yeah, I have a question, Nora. Yeah. Uh, you said that uh, P40, P63 really um, have to be yes. positive in mucoep. Have you seen mucoepidermoid carcinoma that you thought were mucoepidermoid by morphology or in mammal 2 that don't have P40 and P63 because people use that all the time? Yeah. I have, yeah, I have that uh, the problem. Sometimes, yeah, you think about mucoep and you do the stains and it doesn't stain like mucoep. Again, uh, don't be slave to uh, the immuno or the molecular. So we've seen cases, mammal to rearrange, and it looks like mucoep, but it's negative, like these cells that you expect them to be squamoid, the especially the intermediate cells very plastic. So, th and uh, usually the immunostains follow the morphology. So if, if the tumor, these cells that we saw few cases with negative P63 and P40 or very focal, they usually show foamy or spindle or like they very oncocytic, so they don't show very typical morphology. So I think the immunostain kind of follow the morphology. So if you put things together and y y you do everything possible, uh, I, yeah, you, I w yeah, we would call, we call these cases, like I think we have two or three mucoepidermoid carcinoma despite the, the uh, negative P60, P40. However, we also did other things. So if, when you have something that doesn't make sense, do a panel, exclude other possibility, think about the differential, and if you have access to a molecular, do the molecular. So because what if it's something else? Yeah. So now I can I have the official um, agreement to ask Giovanni to make mammal 2 on the preoperative biopsy? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody is heard him. He said yes. So <laughs> <laughs> it's official, yeah. <laughs> now, th there is a last variant that has been recently been described, I think, by B uh, Bishop, and uh, the pure mucus mucopidermoid carcinoma with no with no mite component, and uh, it, it, they look like, I, I've never seen a case like that, but uh, um, they described recently, and that they have the mammal 2 translocation, of course, in addition to the mucoid cells, uh, they, they look like pure mucoid, the mucoid with, with no, with no uh, basal or intermediate cells, yeah, I haven't seen one like this. Yeah, sorry. Just, just a bit, uh, no, no, don't regret to say mammal. No, <laughs> no, 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 I, 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 my comment is about Justin Bishop. I mean, he's a great pathologist, you know, very knowledgeable. Uh, he even wrote very good, mm, you know, one paper on thyroid, uh, you know, the oncocytic with the thing with Bill Westra. The problem is that I, I, I get a feeling that he's like the Chris Fletcher of salivary yeah. gland tumors. I mean, he dissects all these tumors and, and that basically only he or a few other people can make the diagnosis of. Now, uh, and this is unfortunately being reflected in the WHO, and I think that's wrong, uh, because, no, let me finish. Because, uh, <laughs> uh, because, you know, for an entity to be a real thing, mm -hmm. you need three basic items. One is that, you know, the, 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 the entity needs to be clinically relevant. If it is not clinically relevant, it's useless. Mm -hmm. The second and equally important item is that, is that it must be diagnostically reproducible. If you can make a diagnosis only at, you know, sorry, Sloan Academy Cancer Center because you have big power mm -hmm. 
powerful whatever uh, molecular diagnostics or because you are super smart like Chris Fletcher or Justin Bishop. You know, that's not really helpful. I mean, everybody need, must be able to make that diagnosis. And third, you know, it must be biologically sound, what now most diagnoses are. So this is, this is a problem because, you know, the WHO books are, they're, they, in fact, they're only guidelines. They, uh, you know, they, they provide us the uh, 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 standard uh, diagnostic armamentarium to make our work possible and, you know, reproducible. But they're not, you know, uh, God's commandment yeah. on, on the Mount Sinai. So, you know, and, and to have this hyper dissection of, of, of uh, tumor based on, you know, tiny morphologic details which, which exist. I mean, uh, I, they're all true, mm -hmm. uh, but they're basically kind of irrelevant clinically. Mm -hmm. And then if they must be supported by, uh, you know, molecular characterization, which is not feasible, uh, you know, I'm not talking about developing or low income countries, but in many places in Italy, you know, we have no access to, uh, and not even in the States, by the way, uh, because many of these things are not even paid for by insurance. So, you know, that, I that is a significant issue that has to be addressed personally, I believe so. Yeah, actually, just very quickly, Giovanni, I totally agree with you. Actually, I asked this question, um, uh, Justin was uh, presenting several cases of intraductal carcinoma. This one, the oncocytic, uh, everything Nora explained here. I said, you know, I have to tell you, uh, uh, do you ha what is the, I asked him the prognostic significance and therapeutic significance of all this, because I asked him, you know, when the surgeon, after we take a salivary gland, usually, of course, they often want to know if it's adenocystic or not, but once it's not that, they're really interested to know if it is high grade or low grade, because high grade, they will do a nectar section, for example, and things like that. And uh, so I told him, maybe do you imagine one day that uh, at least the salivary gland tumor would be uh, graded, so to speak, uh, a little bit like uh, like the French did with the sarcoma, in a sense like auto, I don't say it will be automatically intermediate grade or high grade and things like that. Uh, instead of doing all this, he told me it will be a very sad day. So it looks like, uh, so this is bring another issue that uh, <coughs> um, I guess everybody wants to do things that seems intellectually exciting, which is yeah, yeah. Uh, the dissecting entity, but everybody forgets that behind all this, there are decisions has to, that have to be made on uh, living people, and you, you need to do things that are helpful in the clinic. I mean, what's the point of, you know, you're not like, you're not a uh, <coughs> oyster scientist, you're not, you know, <coughs> you're not uh, describing oysters, so you really want to, yeah. And so uh, that's, it's a philosoph philosophical <laughs> problem because he considered, basically, well, and this was from Justin, and he's not alone, he considered that it is dumb, uh, it's not, it's not lo like a low class thing, you know, see, <laughs> like to, uh, to, to, uh, to just a great tumor and much better to do. So a little bit really uh, kind of snobbism <coughs> that costs money. Yeah, but uh, there is a final corollary that I, I, I really must make mm -hmm. uh, because it is phil philosophical up to a certain point, actually, mm -hmm. uh, because it has relevance for, you know, again, WHO are, is not God's commandments. Yeah. So you know, they're just guidelines, yeah. essentially, which are important, but, mm -hmm. they, you know, there is another very important thing mm -hmm. that we do not often realize, and particularly, uh, you know, people who are hyper, you know, that they are splitters as opposed to, uh, to lumpers, that uh, uh, using these idiosyncratic terms, which are actually perfectly correct, like, you know, the, the microcystic thing that you showed, uh, you know, in the WHO, they, they're perfectly correct. Mm -hmm. I'm not challenging that. Uh, uh, create diagnostic confusion because even with uh, mm, computerized, I mean, uh, uh, um, computerized mm -hmm. uh, databases, these things go into patients' charts. And clinicians, surgeons, think about a poor surgeon, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, they get confused. Course, and yeah. the more the name is complex, the more the likelihood is there that, you know, they're going to give the wrong treatment simply because they are confused by our terminology. And, that, and there, there, there was a, a poster presented uh, uh, four years ago at one of the USCAP meetings by uh, some people at the University of Colorado in Denver, where they actually went through the charts and checked out all the mistakes that were made because of 
our fault, diagnostic confusion. First in line were actually hematopathology people, mm -hmm. and second in line were soft tissue tumor mm -hmm. pathology people. Mm -hmm. the, 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 with all these variants and subtypes, etc., the surgeons and the treating oncologists got confused and gave the patients the wrong treatment. So I actually pointed this out to, to Ian Cree, and he said, yeah, no, that is an issue, so why don't you check out whether these guys are going to publish their data, and they didn't, because obviously behind these there were lawsuits waiting to happen. Yeah. And so the thing got never published, but I, I, you know, there is evidence for that, and it is underreported, and, and it is a problem. No, it is, it is a problem, and it's always, like I think we are pathologists, as Ronnie always say, clinician with a microscope, so we need to keep that in mind. Uh, we're our role, after all, to help the clinician, help the patient, so there are details. It's, uh, it's nice that we're moving to a more uh, individualized uh, type of medicine, and uh, different tumor may have d d individualized uh, characters, but the main, I think, umbrella is uh, to uh, be practical and uh, to have it uh, like helpful for, for clinically. Do you use synoptic reports? We do, yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, so this case uh, in a, a young uh, person from the lip. Sorry. Let's go more on high power. can see underneath the mucosa, they are uh, infiltrative islands here, no significant atypia, tumor cells has, has some clearing, some eosinophilic, cytoplasm. There are some ductal formation. Here we see also few duct. And here we see uh, the stroma of this tumor. Any idea? Is it mucoep, you think? Well, the mucoep should be considered because if you, you, you can have variants of, low of um, uh, clear cells. Mm -hmm. It is very sclerotic, but very yeah. yes so uh, in addition to muco app what other options you think here yeah hyalinizing clear cell uh, let's see yeah. so it is a hyalinizing clear cell but i agree like muco app it's one of the main differential actually of muco app is hyalinizing clear cell in view of the clearing that you can see sometimes in, in muco app and also keep in mind that you can see focal duct formation and even mucin, intracellular mucin in hyalinizing uh, uh, clear cell carcinoma. So especially small biopsy, actually small biopsy is sometimes very hard to tell them apart because uh, mucin can be focal also in muco app like the case I showed. So how we tell them apart? Uh, first, I think the the uh, architecture of this tumor has many va like uh, variable patterns, some in like a small cluster, some in uh, like uh, trabeculae, some in small like uh, cluster and even like uh, very elongated. This is not very typical of mucoep, this like variable architecture with this uh, angulated uh, uh, trabeculae or small cluster. And oh, yeah, we can see stroma in mucoep and sometimes it's sclerotic, uh, but uh, this, I think, uh, characteristic stroma that we can see here, that it's composed of two components, the hyalinized component around the, the uh, tumor and this fibrocellular stroma. Uh, so th stroma. So these two components of stroma also can be helpful to differentiate it uh, from mucoep. And often when you see duct or mucin is focal, not really extensive. So, and look for a more typical area of mucoep if you think in mucoep. Uh, so this is a case of hyalinizing clear cell carcinoma. We also did uh, the 
uh, fish here and it was uh, positive for the EWS R1. Just for comparison, I want to show you a clear cell variant of a muco app. Uh, yeah, this I think is easy to differentiate, it's not, not always easy, but finding see this like typical uh, areas with abundant mucin or cystic and also the stroma usually not as like uh, diffuse and the architecture is a bit different in a muco app. Uh, although uh, hyalinizing clear cell is uh, more common in uh, uh, minor salivary gland and this may be one of the like feature you can uh, use, uh, but you can see it in major salivary gland. This is a case of hyalinizing clear cell in major salivary gland. Uh, notice there are a few ducts here. Uh, this case, I like it so much because it shows very nicely the two components of the stroma. It gives the tumor this feathery appearance. So sometimes we see the stroma that it looks like this with two components, this hyalinized component, fibrocellular component, uh, this is very characteristic of hyalinizing clear cell carcinoma. Oops, sorry. Let's move on to this case. As nodular area, right? A lot of hyalinization is chlorotic stroma. This duct formation. <laughs> but this area makes it easier. So what do you think? Adenocystic, yeah. yeah. So here we see the typical small cribriformy and tubular pattern. And uh, but uh, notice this like areas here, like very highly nice. And uh, the cribriform can be uh, very diffuse with these like uh, like uh, areas with. Uh, and it's like if you have a biopsy again from the, this hyalinized area, it would be hard to tell if this is muco app. Uh, I'm sorry, this is adenocystic. And PA in the differential here. So uh, PA in the differential of almost everything on small material. Uh, yeah, let me show you also one thing about this case. Notice what's happening here. Yeah, solid growth. So you can see here solid growth with lobules of solid differentiation, less obvious ductal myoepithelial, uh, ductal uh, like a myoepithelial biphasic pattern and more mitotic activities. So this is a case of adenocystic carcinoma with solid growth. Okay, let's look at this one. Yeah, you see area like this, scribber forming, omidonecrosis. move it. So do we know? This necrosis could be a, a sign of high-grade transformation? Yeah, exactly. So this is a case of high-grade transformation adenocystic. And actually, if we look around, that's why it's always helpful to look at everything. We see a conventional, more conventional, let's say, adenocystic with tubular formation. But if we only have this, sometimes it's hard, especially we see this sometimes sinonasal area and uh, where the differential can be brought, can include uh, like a non-intestinal type, high grade, uh, like, uh, like non-intestinal type uh, sinonasal carcinoma, can uh, include neuroendocrine carcinoma. So do a lot of stains in these cases. I also wanna share with you this case because I learned a lot from this case. This is a case from the 
like uh, mendable, I think. And uh, it has a heterogeneous morphology. Um, notice is polypoid here, and uh, if we go on high power here, we see the spindle cell morphology with a malignant spindle cell. So actually, this is on biopsy, we called it spindle cell, malignant spindle cell neoplasm favors spindle cell squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, then on other area, it looks squamous, as you see here. I think this also looks high grade. And on frozen, we had frozen from the margin, they called squamous cell carcinoma. And then areas like this with very ugly cytology, no specific differentiation, micropapillary pattern, very ductile appearance. This is the spindle cell area with a higher grade magnification. Then all of a sudden you have this. do you think? Yeah. yeah. This is a real adenocystic with high-grade transformation. That's why initially this phenomena was called de-differentiation because it can really go even to sarcomatoid. Like, and it's to me, finding a typical morphology, it can explain the heterogeneity. So that's how I explain things. But I, I some people may say this is a squamous or a like a, a spindle cell squamous that's arising ad addition to adenocystic carcinoma. I don't think we did MYB fusion on this, but yeah, I, I think it has a typical morphology and this is really the real high grade transformation or de-differentiation. And I learned since then that salivary gland when it's like, can look like anything. So especially if they have a high grade carcinoma, although it's not common, but it, it can, be salivary gland, even if it doesn't show the typical morphology. And that's happened often on biopsy again. But on, on surgical material, if you put enough section, look everywhere, you uh, likely to find something helpful like this area in this case. Okay. Uh, what do you think of this case? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's very important. It's in the palate. It has this lobular, nodular, like gross pattern that is invasive, we said in salivary gland. It has a cribriform pattern, right? Go on high power view. Yeah. Actually, I showed you a picture of this case. Uh, this is a case of a cribriform adenocarcinoma that has this cliff-like appearance, the, the cribriform pattern, the fibrosis, the blood lake, and although it's cribriforming or solid, but on high power view, it has this uh, like PTC-like nuclear feature with vesicular chromatin as in one cell types, which can be helpful to differentiate it from a typical polymorphous adenocarcinoma. Um, okay, let me. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, benign or malignant. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's invasive, right? Let's look closer. Then we have the Asner cells. Yeah. And then we also have this microcystic pattern. And notice lymphoestroma is quite dense, but we see that in SNX cell carcinoma. It's another case of SNX cell carcinoma. You know, I always want to understand the nonspecific glandular like type of morphology they describe. And I think this case maybe has areas like maybe these. OK, 
case also difficult. It has necrosis. The cells look very thin and I, I'm telling you, you should be a salivary gland pathologist. Cynic. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, uh, if I only have this, I wouldn't be able really to tell. But uh, I think this, let's see if I can find the area that... Uh, to this their focal area here where we have the lymphoid stroma and if we go on high power yeah this area we see that there are acinar cells and you can see the the area of again this is acinic cell carcinoma with high grade transformation and we did the nor one on this case and is positive in the like uh, high grade area and in the area with typical morphology where the lymphoid here. So this is quite helpful. Okay, the last case. So cystic. Speculation, pink cytoplasm, colloid like. Uh, a secretion, and then also if we go on high power here, we see more the typical morphology. What do you think? Yeah, secretory carcinoma. <laughs> so now you all. You know all about salivary gland tumors. I think this is my last case for you today. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Questions? Thank you. If is there any, any question? Or otherwise we can close the session. I think uh, we, we thank a lot. Dr. Nara Katabi for her explanation, her presentation, and uh, I want to suggest you to read her papers that are very clear, very nice, and very useful in everyday practice. Thank you, Thank you very much. And uh, now Dr. Barbareski will yes. say. Yes, we're coming to the end. We share all your knowledge with the spectacular today. Thank you, Dr. Katabi. Thank you. Uh, so thanks for everybody for having been here, especially to the faculty. They shared with us all their knowledge and they showed us spectacular cases. I enjoyed the case presentation very much, both at the microscope and the, at the screen projection. I think this is uh, uh, the best way, once you have the formal presentation and then you have the cases and you, you activate your mind and try to, uh, to, to, to go to the diagnosis and that activate that very much. So I uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, you being here. I hope everybody enjoyed the meeting. We have another meeting on uh, skin pathology in May. I hope somebody of you will come and uh, follow us uh, in this uh, new uh, uh, seminar on, on skin pathology. So thank you everybody and have a safe trip home. <laughs>